Genesis 11. Uh, it's helpful to understand that Genesis 11 can be understood as the last chapter of this section in Genesis, if you will. As for starting in the genealogy of Shem in Genesis 11.10, the next verse, and especially chapter 12, the shift focuses to Abram. It is with Abram's call from God where God's story of redemption is more clearly revealed and advances. Uh, to review so far in Genesis 1 through 2, we studied the creation of the world, the creation of man, the life of the first man and woman, and the communion between God and mankind. In Genesis 3, we studied the temptation of man, the sin of man, the fall of man, and the in inauguration of death to mankind. In Genesis 4 through 5, we studied life after men's exile from the Garden of Eden, the first murder of a prophet when Cain killed his brother Abel, the genealogy of Cain and the genealogy of Seth. And starting in chapter 3, we see God revealing his grace, his redemption, his plan in, in the salvation of the world. In Genesis 6 through 8, we studied the ancient world and its unbelievable wickedness, the judgment of God in the flood and the preservation of Noah and his family. In Genesis 8 through 10, we studied the covenant of God to Noah and mankind, life in the new world for Noah and his family, and the descendants of Noah who came from his three sons. Before we turn to the next section of the book, if you will, we have one more aspect of the history of the world that the Bible records for us, and that's here, Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9. It details for us an account of a generation's disobedience and God's prudent intervention. Within this account, we learn of the origin of languages, and in the account, we learn more about God's character, both in his imminence and sovereignty. Before we first highlight the disobedience of the generation, I want to establish this contemporary relevance for us. Genesis 11 is a valuable text to meditate upon as we consider subjects like government, societies, politics, and even elections. Have you heard of election anxiety? Of course, the reality has been here for some time, and it's only growing worse. Various news articles are sharing their statistics, their recommendations from psychologists in how to de-stress and how to cope. I want to read from an article I read earlier this week. In a survey, 53%, in fact, are having such anxiety over the election that they're avoiding even talking about it. A similar survey released by the Residential M Mental Health Treatment System, AMFM, found that 22% of 2,000 surveyed Americans, one out of every five, feel the current election cycle is harming their mental health. The experts are saying this year's election has been a significant source of stress and anxiety. In another survey, there was upwards to 70% of Americans experiencing anxiety over this year's elections. The Wall Street Journal reports that America is having a panic attack over the election and that many are turning to weed gummies and deep breathing exercises to tame their fears. Some mainstream media outlets have taken on the role of comfort counselor, listing their top tips for how to calm down. Later in the article, I found it valuable to read what the commentator said. What if the stress and anxiety experienced by the people in this country reflect a deeper problem that requires a much deeper solution than setting boundaries using substances and trying muscle relaxation techniques? Side note, there's a variety of percentages. We won't truly know how many. Nevertheless, in personal conversations and from what I can see in my experience, I fear that in this season, anxiety might just be the elephant of the, in the room, including for Christians. We just so happen to be days away from elections. Um, but even if we weren't, I find that Genesis 11 to be one of those accounts in Scripture to be helpful in the battle against, uh, the battle against anxiety over what happens in any society, in any culture, in any country, and in every generation. By revisiting God's imminence and sovereignty in Genesis 11, and choosing once again to trust in God's sovereignty, you and I can find peace for our souls, peace in every season, peace in whatever location on earth, peace in whatever country or whatever kind of government on earth. Let's read again verses 1 through 4. 
Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. How much time has elapsed since um, Noah's covenant with God and his three sons then populating the earth? Some say at minimum 100 years, upwards to 300 years. Based on the genealogy of chapter 10, we can conclude that there was a massive world population by this time. Secondly, where was this city and tower? Where is Shinar? Most scholars identify Shinar with ancient Sumer or Babylonia. This is situated in present-day Iraq, particularly the region near the Persian Gulf. In verse 4, we read the objective. Objective 1, to build a city. Objective 2, within that city, to build a tower to reach the heavens. The third objective, a name for ourselves or self-exaltation. And 4, uh, well, why do all these things? For, to avoid being scattered across the earth. I want to highlight the two phrases, let us make a tower whose top is in the heavens, and the other, let us make a name for ourselves. Uh, for some of you, you might be thinking, why does this sound familiar? Look at what Isaiah says in the prophecy against the king of Babylon and against Satan. Isaiah 14, 13 through 14, it says, you said in your heart, speaking of Satan, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Can you see more clearly that this city's corporate desire to uh, was to assert human autonomy without God. I think this phrase, let us make the tower and a name for ourselves, makes their objective of self-glorification and human autonomy clear. The second objective is their rebellion. That phrase that says, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Or as other translations record it, otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the earth. How do we know that this is rebellion? The answer is found in the previous command of blessing from God to Noah, his sons, and by default, the human race. This blessing is given to us in chapter 9. Let me quote to you Genesis 9.1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Looking further in God's blessing as he continues to speak, consider Genesis 9-7. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Twice, he commands. As we look at chapter 10, it seems that God's command to command of multiplication was well accepted in the generations leading up to the rebellion here. The text seems to suggest a massive world population in just a few generations. But as you can see, God's second command to fill the earth was not accepted by this generation. Verse 4 makes that clear that they did not want to fill the earth. They did not want to be scattered across the earth. The people of the city sought to rebel against the command of God and centralized the world civilization to one city. Their intentions were undoubtedly rebellious. Their unification on this particular matter was a direct rebellion towards what God commanded. The one word that describes the city and people here is rebellion. How does God respond to the rebellion? Verse 5 but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. 
Verse 6 clarifies that they were still actively building it. The thing I want to highlight here is the fact that the scripture says the Lord came down to see it. The Lord came down to see it. First, this tells us that the Lord allowed the building of it for some time. In other words, he did not act immediately, did he? For example, in verses 3 through 4, you see the groundwork and confederation of the city. Fast forward several weeks, months, maybe years. It's suggested that there's sufficient progress underway. In time, verse 5 records that the Lord comes to see their labor. I want us to meditate on the nature of God for a moment from this text. While God is immutable, meaning he's unchanging, while God is transcendent, the scripture also reveals that he is imminent or personal and accommodational. In the account of Genesis 11, similar to Genesis 6, we see the active participation of God. This is a good text to see the difference between deism and theism. A deistic God creates the universe, establishes natural laws to govern it, and chooses not to interfere, rather allowing humility to exercise governance over earthly affairs. But this is not the God of the Bible. It's an incorrect view of God. In sharp contrast, a theistic God, the true God, the God of the Bible, reveals to us that God has an ongoing personal relationship with his creation, involving his divine revelation and his divine intervention. This is what we call his imminence. A simple reference would be the prophesied name of Jesus, Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. Yes, God is immutable and sovereign, and God is also imminent. He is intimately engaged, infinitely loving, and incredibly patient. Of course, knowing the scriptures, knowing God's character, knowing God's redemptive story from Genesis to Revelation, as readers, we see this rebellion as a failure from conception. How much more God's? with the immutable decree of his sovereign plan in eternity past, was this not a failure from conception in his eyes? Yet, the Lord comes down to see the rebellion of man. Look at his response in verse six. And the Lord said, indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Or nothing they plan to do will be impossible from them. The context reveals the nature or the heart of the Lord's response. Remember, the objective is rebellion against God's plan. The foundation is wrong, the foundation is wicked. Unity in rebellion, unity in wickedness is limitless in potential destruction. Before I changed my major to biblical studies and went to graduate school in theology, uh, I studied, uh, I pursued history, particularly the history of the Eastern world. I enjoy it very much, as some of you do as well. For those of you who study history, you know, as well as I, uh, we, you know as well as I that we constantly see a pattern, and it's the truth from Ecclesiastes, where the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 says, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Well, we, the potential of what we see in Genesis 11, we just have to go back and look at history. Unity and rebellion against God produces the Cambodian genocide or the Armenian genocide. Unity and rebellion against God produces the Holocaust of the Jews. Unity and rebellion produces the great leap forward in the Cultural Revolution in China under Mao Zedong. 
Unity and rebellion produces the great purge, Holodomor, and the Gulag system in Russia under Stalin. And bear in mind, these all occurred in the past 110 years, essentially in the past generation, about four, uh, in the past century, about four generations. Mankind, made in the image of God with incredible gifting, talent, intelligence, sophistication, is capable of incredible feats, both for good and sadly for evil. Men and women designed by God to be in community and unity are able to do incredible things together for good and sadly for evil. It's good to be reminded that unity for good, unity for God's will, unity between God's people is commanded and blessed by God. Psalm 133, 1 through 3, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Unity is the divine reality we have in Christ. We become one with God in Christ. We enter into Christ's body with Christ as the head. And on this journey of faith, until the final redemption, the Holy Spirit transforms his people and his church to walk in practical unity. God's unity is perfect and beautiful. But the contrast is here in Genesis 11. Rebellious unity, wicked unity that is despised by God. Coming back to the text, man's potential particularly for evil, is restrained by one new factor, what God originates here. Note verse seven. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. For the newer Christian, have you wondered where languages come from? They come from this event. As I think about God's original plan, fill the earth, I am of the opinion that the origin of various languages would have happened naturally. If this emerging civilization simply obeyed and spread throughout the earth, the emergence of languages would have been the natural outcome. To see why I say this, try to read an English document from 1,000 years ago. Old English is virtually incomprehensible to a modern English speaker. Language naturally develops and naturally transforms as humans intermarry and migrate with other peoples and cultures. Regardless, Genesis 11 was God's intervention. Not that God reacted, but rather that God guarantees what was, what is, and what will be. In other words, the nations, countries, cultures, and different languages was always God's plan from the beginning. Also, I don't agree that languages were God's judgment upon man. This text does not say that languages are a judgment or that languages are inherently a negative consequence. Rather, the instant confusion of languages was God's prudent intervention. Now let's read verses 8 through 9, the outcome. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Twice it says, the Lord scattered them. The Lord scattered them. Reflecting back on Genesis 9, the Lord commanded and blessed man by saying, fill the earth. The dispersion and habitation of people all over the earth was a good thing because it was God's will. And God's will, will advance. It advances here, and it continues to advance. And check this out. For all eternity, the uniqueness of nations and nationalities is something that God will preserve. To understand the beauty of nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues, it's valuable to meditate on the future of the redeemed. As believers, God has prepared the new earth for us. 
Let's read about that new earth. Revelation 21, 22 through 27 says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall, be no, there, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's clear in the new earth, nations and national identities are realities that will continue forever. The beauty of diversity is preserved for all eternity. It's been like that since the beginning. Until the restoration of all things, what is the perspective that you and I should have? Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16 tells us this. You can write this down. All these people who were still living by faith when they died, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Speaking of believers in the Old Testament, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God has prepared a city for us. Don't forget, my brothers and sisters, in the most basic sense, we are foreigners and strangers on earth. As the people of God, we are monarchists. Jesus Christ is our king. He is coming to establish his kingdom. We are longing for his return and the country he brings. The country, the city that God has prepared for us. In every generation since the city of Babel, fallen man seeks to create an ideal city. Mere men seek to create a utopian society. No doubt there is a human longing for a perfect city. But what is absolutely clear is that the creature cannot do what only the creator will do. Praise be to God that he has prepared the city of perfection for us. We long for this. Coming now to our application in our generation, while we long for and await the return of our King and Savior, what are some meditations and applications for us today? The first is, God is sovereign. Let me quote to you several verses. Psalm 29.10, the Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as King forever. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 47, 8, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Psalm 66, 7, he rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Psalm 67, 4, Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. These five verses I've shared uh, with you are just from the book of Psalms. There are so many more verses that remind us that today God is sovereign over the affairs of the earth. Do you believe that? Or a better question, is this what you are trusting in today? Are you anxious over things you cannot control politically, governmentally, culturally, societally? Have you forgotten who reigns and governs the nations? Have you forgotten who sits on his throne? Are you daily putting your trust in the one who is sovereign? Second, man's limitation. As we read in Genesis 11, although mankind attempted to rebel against God's will, mankind learned very quickly that God's plan is unchanging. In his sovereignty, God will intervene 
and apply limitations on man. When a prideful man believes the fantasy that his potential is limitless, he will learn very quickly who is king of the earth. Psalm 75, 7, but God is the judge. He puts down and exalts another. As we read in our reading this morning, Psalm 2, 1 through 4, to repeat just the first four verses. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. The second application this morning is, while there are men and women hungry for power in our world, there are men and women who think they can change the course of this world, a country, a culture, a society, a people. Some even think they're gods. How foolish. Genesis 11 reminds us that man is dust, but the Lord, he is God. For a personal application, it's important to remember that pride is the downfall of any man or woman. Choose the fear of the Lord. Choose humility today. Submit yourself to the Lord and receive his love and blessing. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6 tells us, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due time. The third thing is, God sees. When this united rebellion to make the city and tower was developing, what does it first say of the Lord? The Lord came down to see. In a different sense, our loving Father, God sees you and I. God sees all of our brothers and sisters in Christ worldwide. Did you know that we, aren't, we weren't the only country with elections this year? There have been almost 60 different elections worldwide this year. Christians in 60 different countries who are undergoing governmental, societal, and cultural shifts as you and I. And God sees all his children. Those free, those persecuted, those rich, those poor, those anxious, those worried, or those moving forward, or those struggling to trust in the sovereignty of God. God sees you and I. Remember, God in his omniscience knows the outcome of all things, knowing the end from the beginning. And we know that all things ultimately conform to God's sovereign plan. God's story of redemption is well underway. God's kingdom is advancing. The restoration of all things in Jesus Christ is expanding. And the return of Christ, his kingdom, and the new creation is coming. Who or what do you and I have to fear when our trust is in the one who holds all things together? Who or what do you and I have to fear when our king is Jesus Christ? the one who is before all things, the one who is sitting at the right hand of the Father's throne governing the affairs of men. The third application is, Genesis 11 reminds us that God sees, reminding us how personal he is in all human affairs. More specifically as a personal application, the creator is our shepherd and father who personally loves us and cares for us. In the scriptures, we are told that God not only sees, he draws near. And we are called to draw near to him. First Peter 5, 7 tells us these words. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The assurance we have is the God who sees, is the God who cares. The God who sees is the God who draws near. 
we are called to draw near to Jesus. And by following our shepherd, he will take us to green pastures. He will lead us beside quiet waters. He will refresh our souls. He will guide us along the right path. He is with us. And he comforts us. His plan is for our good. What a shepherd we have in Jesus. In all the uncertainties of life, in all the changing seasons of life, in all the complexities of life, in all the trials that Christians will face in a given generation, let me remind you what our shepherd has given to us today. John 14, 27 through 28, where Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. Jesus gives us his peace, a supernatural peace. Are you resting in the peace of Jesus? If you are not resting in that peace today, receive his peace by prayer and by faith. By faith, ask for Christ's peace. It is yours to possess.